When Tim Cook announced the Mac was transitioning from Intel to Apple Silicon, he said it was for one reason and one reason only, so they could make much better products. And Apple Silicon was the only way that they could do it. But what does that even really mean? Sponsored by CuriosityStream, now bundled with my streaming service, Nebula. I'm Rene Ritchie, and if you want to be the first to know what's really happening with Apple Silicon and the Mac, hit that subscribe button and bell right now. Moving the Mac to Apple Silicon is exciting, but honestly, Apple Silicon isn't even the most exciting thing about it. It's the features that Apple Silicon is going to enable. I'll get to the specific Macs and specific features in a minute, but for years, Apple's been able to deliver experiences on iOS devices, on the iPhone and iPad, that simply haven't been practical or even possible on the Mac. And why? Because on the iPhone and iPad, Apple's owned everything from the hardware to the software to the interface, including, yeah, the silicon. But on the Mac, they've been dependent on Intel and working around Intel. For example, when Intel failed to support the 5K displays that Apple really wanted for the Retina iMac, Apple built their own custom timing controller. We all lost target display mode, but Apple managed to fuse the bandwidth together to support pushing that many pixels, if only internally. When Intel failed to deliver HEVC support, H.265, and shunting it off to the GPU just wasn't good enough, Apple used custom encode-decode blocks on their own T2 chips, essentially a variant of the A10 from the iPhone 7 to handle it instead. Same with the secure enclave for Touch ID and Apple Pay, the always-on processor for voice-activated Siri, the storage controller on real-time data encryption, and the list just goes on and on and on and on. But building that much scaffolding is just inefficient, and I can only imagine exhausting, especially when you're still stuck with Intel's increasingly hot, increasingly power-hungry CPUs, continuously trying to just burst out of your bead-blasted unibody chest like an alien, and you're desperately trying to hold it all in. And every YouTuber is just facepalm thumbnail fire emoji, fire emoji, fire emoji, and just none of that happens at all on the iPad. So. The Mac is moving to Apple Silicon, and we should start to see features more in line with and more on pace with the iPad. We're even seeing some of them already. Apple's just recently shown the new Restore system, which will let you recover your Mac using a hidden container, and the new full and reduced security modes for casual and hobby users respectively, things that just weren't possible before Apple Silicon. Also, hypervisor acceleration for virtual machines, just built right in, and all of that shows that now that they're fully in control of their silicon destiny, Apple pretty much can and will design the chips to specifically support and accelerate the features that they want to put into the operating systems. So when you take what Apple's already been able to deliver for the iPhone and the iPad, and the workarounds they've already provided for the Mac, and the new stuff they've already hinted at in the new silicon, it sets up just a huge amount of potential for the next generation of Macs. Of course, Apple hasn't said what exactly is coming or when, and it's totally fair to assume that things will start off more conservatively, more slowly, just to keep the transition as rock solid as possible. And yeah, there are some potential drawbacks and downsides as well. Real ones we already know about, like the loss of Windows on boot camp, but also potential ones, like the SOC is just not being ready on time, or not providing any performance that's actually any better than Intel and maybe not providing any graphics that's ever better than AMD or what NVIDIA can provide now. But like I said in my last video, spending all this money, making all this Apple Silicon up front, that's the risk Apple's taking. And they're only gonna get their payoff if they succeed, if they actually make better Macs that all of us wanna buy. For example, Apple announced the 12 inch MacBook back in 2015, the same year they announced the iPad Pro. Both were just these ultra thin, ultra light, ultra silent with not a fan in sight computers. But while the iPad Pro was also ultra powerful, the 12 inch MacBook was most decidedly not. And that came down to the difference between Intel's anemic Core MY series and embedded graphics and Apple's increasingly performant A series systems on a chip. So it's really not hard to imagine something in between that 12 inch MacBook and the MacBook Air, but instead of Core M, it's got one of Apple's new family of SOCs. You'd have a computer every bit as powerful as the current iPad Pro. More even, if the SOC is on the new ARM V9 instruction set and the five nanometer process, just like the A14 series might be this fall, and it's not as constrained by the size and power envelope of the iPad. 
and like the iPad Pro, maybe a smaller one at 12 inches, edge to edge, and a bigger one at 14 inches, with more than the iPad Pro's current limit of six gigabytes of RAM and the traditional clamshell form factor traditional laptop users just know and love. It wouldn't be a workstation. It wouldn't be meant to be anything in the same universe as a workstation. But if you have a workstation at home or in the studio and you just wanna travel with something ultra light, Apple could even build in acceleration for Final Cut Pro and Logic Pro and Xcode and for third-party Pro apps beyond anything Intel has been capable of to date. Remember, that 12-inch MacBook on Intel choked on a single stream of 4K, while the iPad Pro can handle multiple streams, like a boss, and that was three and five years ago. I did a video about how Apple could add multi-touch to the Mac. With the new version of macOS Big Sur, there's been more space added to everything, size, better for everything. Even the menu bar, which has historically been super bitsy, is now just a super less bit bitsy. Would it be perfect for multi-touch? No, just like the iPad isn't perfect for cursor. Could it be good enough? Link to all that in the description. Another option the iPad Pros had basically forever that the MacBooks have just never ever gotten is cellular networking. It's 4G LTE right now, but it's expected to go to 5G sub six, maybe even sub nine at the low end and MM wave at the high end this fall when Apple's renewed partnership with Qualcomm kicks back in. Now, Apple could have added a cellular modem to the MacBooks at any time. They'd have to figure out the antennas and give Mac OS the far more data efficient features iOS has enjoyed for also basically forever, but it costs a freaking fortune to license the modems and IP. In other words, Qualcomm is famous for demanding a hefty share of the profits. The iPad option is already $120 and based on MacBook prices, it could go even higher. But other companies are already doing just that. And it means paying for an additional cellular plan with some 5G versions being just painfully expensive and others be truly excruciating and 5G service still being largely mythical in most parts of the world, but they're doing it. And that's where Apple Silicon comes in. See, Apple didn't just agree to buy Qualcomm chips. Like with ARM, they also agreed to license the technology. And then they bought Intel's modem business, basically the modems that they'd been using in the iPhone before the new agreement kicked in with Qualcomm. So it's totally possible Apple will just always leave Mac connectivity to tethering, but it's also possible Apple could just wait a couple or a few years until they're ready to ship their own custom modems integrated right into the Apple Silicon as well, both for iOS devices and who knows, maybe for the Mac. Now, the question of course is, would you even want a cellular Mac if you could get one? Let me know in the comments below. With a MacBook or MacBook Air, you're looking at an ultralight device, very much like an iPad. For a MacBook Pro though, you're looking at something quite a bit more. For mainstream pros, maybe a MacBook Pro without a fan. But for MacBook Pro pros, just given the better chassis, the better cooling, and the higher power draw that it would all allow, well, we'll just have to wait and see what kind of Apple Silicon SoC that it'll really allow especially in terms of graphics, where well, they'll be trading in the dedicated AMD chips for integrated Apple chips and dedicated accelerators and controllers. And not just for hypervisors either, but for absolutely any feature Apple wants to make as absolutely high performance as possible, whatever it takes to make the pro tools and pro workflow teams happy. And yeah, us as well. The goal should be every ounce of power Intel's delivered to date and more with nothing like the power draw or thermal constraints. And since Apple Silicon also houses Apple's own custom display controllers, we could get better custom displays as well. Because when it comes to displays, everyone pretty much has access to all the same panels and all the same processes, whatever they're willing and able to pay for. But Apple has been demanding not just their own panel specs for years already on the iPhone and iPad, but building their own display controllers as well. Things that enable the 120 Hertz adaptive refresh rate on the ProMotion of the iPad Pro displays and handles all the performance and mitigations on the OLED on the iPhone as well. Apple's display team has already brought their DCI P3 wide gamut pipeline to the Mac, their True Tone dynamic color temperature matching, their, even their adjustable refresh between 48 and 60 Hertz on the 16 inch MacBook Pro. But there's still more they can do. Maybe not with OLED because of its quirkiness, but with mini LED, something that tries to better balance out some of those good characteristics like deeper blacks and higher contrast ratios with less of the bad ones like color shifts and sometimes less than consistent brightness levels across those wider panels. And of course, if Apple ever decides to just unnote multi-touch or Apple Pencil support for the Mac, all of that is already built to just work with all of this as well. So, 
drop a like below if those are the kind of things you wanna see on the Mac. Now, with all of these next generation systems, Apple's gonna to have to decide if they wanna use the far greater efficiency of custom silicon to keep the same level of performance at even smaller weights and sizes or boost that performance at the same weights and sizes. For something like the MacBook Air, portability is absolutely gonna beat out performance. For something like the MacBook Pro though, the reverse is hopefully true. But what about the desktops? Apple could take the current Mac mini design and just power it up to perfect home server levels. Basically the all in the box for anyone who doesn't want a built-in display or a big old cheese grater tower. Though I'm sure that by far, I'm not the only Mac nerd still just begging for an expandable mini tower as well. But alas, my fanfic budget for this video only goes so far. Now, Apple could also go the other way, maintain current performance levels and just carve away so much casing, the mini becomes more of an Apple TV sized Mac Nano. I mean, with an SOC, as long as you have the ports, you don't really need much in the way of a box. Especially considering after Intel released the Thunderbolt 4 news last week, Apple sent me a statement, one I shared on Twitter, reaffirming their commitment to the technology and that they'll continue to support Thunderbolt with their custom silicon. And that's something beyond what Apple's ever done with the iPad Pro, at least so far, where there's USB-C out, but no extra PCIe lanes, so no Thunderbolt out. With USB 4 on the way, which keeps the USB-C connector and basically supersets Thunderbolt right in, it could end up finally, finally delivering on the promise of one interconnect to integrate them all across the whole Mac lineup. With the iMac, I think what's exciting people the most are the rumors of a redesign. I did a whole video on that already. So seriously, make sure you hit that subscribe button and bell so you don't miss out. But beyond having a more retro future iPad Pro-like design and potentially a mini LED display, Apple Silicon also opens up the potential for technologies like Face ID. The MacBook Air and MacBook Pro both have had Touch ID for years. The first generation was essentially an Apple Watch system and package and display controller just buried right next to the touch bar. The current one is like an A10 chip just buried under the power button. But Apple has never pushed the technology to the desktop Mac, not ever. Not even the keyboards included with the iMac Pro or Mac Pro. And it's not because of a security issue. Apple figured out how to securely transit Touch ID authentication on the iPhone to the Mac years ago. Same with Apple Watch Unlock. They even use time of flight to prevent relay attacks. It's super cool tech, but it is expensive. They'd have to put a system in package or a system on a chip inside the keyboard, and that would bump up the cost considerably for a peripheral. Modern Apple Silicon though, has an ANE, an Apple neural engine just built right in, and that's what powers Face ID. Sure, putting a true depth camera system in an iMac would also be expensive, but like Touch ID on the MacBook Pro, the expense would be in the computer, not in the standalone keyboard. Now, Maybe no Face ID in the Pro Display XDR, it just means it's not a technology Apple's interested in shipping with the Mac, but I think that would be a huge missed opportunity. Not just because having Face ID on the iMac and all the MacBooks, frankly, would be incredibly convenient, and not just because having a true depth camera would finally bring the Mac at least partially into the world of Apple's next big thing, augmented reality, but because it would also high key help solve the ongoing embarrassment that is that potato can problem on almost all of the current Macs. And yeah, I know, all some of you wanna hear from me right now is Apple Pencil support and a drawing board mode for an iMac Studio. But that's just less about silicon and more about philosophy. Still, let me know your preference in the comments. Does it seem just hella odd that Apple would release a Mac Pro last year and then an Intel to Apple transition plan this year? Now, don't get me wrong, Intel Macs won't just remain useful for years to come, but for pros specifically, the ones that struggle to get their software they need supported even on Macs with Intel, they'll likely remain table stakes just for years to come. But in a system on a chip world, where does the ultimate system spread out across entire cheese grater tower even fit in? And yeah, this is where my speculation really just goes full on fanfic. But Apple knew about the Intel transition when they were building this new Mac Pro when they were spending those two or three long years in the desert with the Pro Workflows team, just figuring out what a modern, modular Mac really meant, really needed to be. And it's hard to imagine the Intel to Apple transition wasn't something they considered. A lot, like a lot, a lot. Sure, it's possible that was just one last hurrah, the end of Big Iron, and the Mac Pro will be sent off to sit in a rocking chair next to the Xserve, Elvis, and Bruce Lee, and yeah, Bubba Hotep but it's also possible the Mac Pro will just transition to Apple Silicon along with the rest of the lineup. Just in its heart, 
Instead of Xeon cores, it'll have the monster of all Apple SoC. And maybe Metal and the various performance and machine learning controllers, the ones that Apple designed to abstract away the hodgepodge of silicon, the one that's always just lurked below the surface, the different CPUs and custom chips and GPUs and any given Mac, any given year, will still enable a variety of options. See, beyond the petty feuds of the past, the dirty little secret about why there's no NVIDIA in modern Macs is that they're at absolute cross purposes with Apple. NVIDIA wants to be the most important part of any machine and totally commoditize the PC that's wrapped around it. It doesn't matter what you buy or build, it just has to have NVIDIA and CUDA cores and you're all set. Apple, by starkest of contrasts, wants the most important part to be the machine and to totally commoditize the components inside. Doesn't matter if one year it's NVIDIA, the next AMD, and in the future, Apple graphics. Just buy the Mac and you're all set. And they're both big and powerful and successful enough companies that neither sees any need to budge. AMD though, seems happy to do whatever Apple needs them to do. So yeah, maybe AMD can still exist in a post Apple Silicon world, just abstracted away behind metal as another compute resource the way it's been for the last few years. Or maybe Apple with a bank even bigger than Nvidia's decides to spend the next few years, whatever years it takes to spin graphics chips every bit as good, maybe even better. I mean, who would have thought five years ago we'd be seeing where Intel is now and where Apple is gonna be soon. Or maybe, just maybe it's something entirely new and Apple sticks to the SOC, but has a bunch of accelerator and expander cards available, reprogrammable ASICs like Afterburner, but not just for ProRes, for a wide variety of different compute needs and like the storage expander, but not just for storage, for memory and other assets as well. Maybe, just maybe, that's what the next generation of massively modular Macs really, really means and was really designed to be, just like the next generation of video with Nebula. Nebula is the amazingly cool new streaming video service I'm building with a group of education creator friends. People like Ali Abdal, Sos Notes, Thomas Frank, Low Spec Gamer, Lessons from the Screenplay, and many more. It's a place where we can try out new things without having to worry about the tyranny of the algorithm or being demonetized or just being told to stay in our YouTube lane. And there are terrific originals like Tom Scott's Money and Alex Goes Bananas, which you might just see me in sometime soon. Also the working title series where a bunch of us take a look at a bunch of our favorite TV shows, something that would just never work on any of our channels with any of this algorithm, but works fantastically well on Nebula. It's also a place where we can post all of our regular videos, videos just like this one without any ads or sponsorships at all. In fact, new ad-free, sponsor-free content from amazing creators goes up not just every week, but every day, multiple times a day, which is great if you're tired of waiting for updates from just every other service. Even special and extended versions of our videos, like I've been posting the full-length versions of my interviews on Nebula as well, 45-minute chats with iJustine, Brian Tong, Walt Mossberg, and more to come. And now, because Nebula comes bundled with CuriosityStream, you also get access to its thousands of documentaries and series by people like David Attenborough, Chris Hatfield, which right now is discounted all the way down to just $14.97 a year. Yeah, for the whole year. Seriously, it's the better best deal in streaming today. Just go to curiositystream.com slash Rene Ritchie for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series. And now Nebula as well and enter the promo code Rene Ritchie to start your membership completely free for the first 31 days. Thanks CuriosityStream and thanks to all of you for your support. Check out my Mac playlist right here and see you next video.